Well, we come to the second of our series on the I Am sayings of Jesus last week. Uh, I hope that Zach uh, spoke on uh, uh, I Am the Bread of Life. And uh, this morning, as you've heard from our reading, we're on I Am the Light of the World, said Jesus. We have other I Am sayings coming up in the future. I Am the Resurrection and the Life. Uh, I Am the Way, the Truth, and the Life, and so forth. Uh, And when we consider the I Am sayings of Jesus, these are incredible statements for anybody to make. Uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis, if I can paraphrase him, said that somebody who said the kind of things that Jesus said can either only be mad, bad, or God. Uh, And he described himself as a reluctant convert to Christendom or Christianity because he, with his intellect, said, well, Jesus could not have been mad. He could not have been bad. And logically, therefore, he must be God. But Jesus said, I am Not just the light of the world, but so many other things that we look at over the next weeks. And last week, I am the bread of life. I want to bring you back uh, to uh, quite an early part of the Bible, if if I may, if you have your Bible to open there, Exodus chapter 3 and verses uh, 13 to 15. Uh, And here we have Moses being called by God to lead the children of Israel out of slavery and into the promised land. Uh, And Moses is full of all kinds of insecurities. Uh, And one of the things he wants to be able to say to God is, how will they know who has sent me? How how will they know that that you are God? Uh, And uh, verse 13 of Exodus 3, we read this. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's a very strange thing to say, isn't it? You know, uh, hey folks, I I just want to tell you, I am has sent me to you. Uh, You can imagine Moses going to the children of Israel with that. Uh, Bible commentator Hard Peskett writes this, God said to Moses, I am who I am, which may be paraphrased as, I always will be what I always have been. And he then says, the words was, is, and will be are the vocabulary of created beings on their way from the past to the future. But God is the great I am. Augustine put it this way, he was because he was never lacking, He will be because he never will be lacking. He is because he always is. Now, I'm not a theologian, uh, and I'm very thankful for some of the courses I learned as a child that taught me biblical truth. So I think if I can sum up Pescott and Augustine with the words of little course I learned as a child, yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never glory to his name. So God is saying very clearly in the Old Testament that the Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to would have understood that when some rabbi said, I am the light of the world or the bread of life, whatever it might be, he was actually making a claim to be God. Uh, And that was a very, very incredible thing to say. Now, I'm devastated to learn this morning that Zach Cole does not know who the Osmonds are. Uh, who remembers the Osmonds? Yeah, right, it's exactly, there's a few people who remember, that's American superstars and little Donny Osmond, long-haired lover from Liverpool. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that. But about 10 or 11 years ago, there was a, a, a quiz show on TV called Identity, and it was hosted by Donny Osmond. Anybody ever remember that, seeing it? One brave soul. I watched it once and that was enough. Uh, And the the whole theory of the show was there were a number of people and people had clues to work out their identity and who they were. Uh, And then Donny Osmond would maybe say, somebody would make a guess at somebody, and Donny Osmond would say, Zach, forgive me for my very poor American accent. Donny Osmond would say, with number five, please reveal what is your identity. Uh, and the person would 
say whether they, the, the person choosing had got it right or wrong. What is your identity? But you know, in fact, this is what was going on with Jesus. As he taught and preached and wandered around Palestine, people were saying, who is he? Where's he from? Surely he's the illegitimate child of Mary. She was pregnant with him before she and Joseph got married. Surely he's just the carpenter's son. Surely he's just a, an ordinary man from Nazareth. I mean, nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth, a wee backwater village. And maybe some were saying, but surely he couldn't do all the miracles he was doing if he isn't God. And so the whole question as to the identity of Jesus was swirling around the society of which he was a part. And the Jews would have been aware that God had revealed himself as the great I am. And in that context of Jews understanding that somebody who said the I am's was actually claiming to be God, this brought a whole new uh, feature into their thinking. And so John chapter 8 and 12, the, the verse we began with in our reading, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of world. Now, in the Old Testament, the term light was applied to both God and to the law. The law was given that people would have the light of God's Word and show them the way to live. And so, light was very much associated with God and with His Word, with His law. And for someone to claim to be the light of the world and that those who followed him would never walk in darkness, he was in fact directly claiming to be God. Little wonder that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, couldn't let that pass. Verse 13 of John 8, the Pharisees challenged him, here you are, appearing as your own witness, your testimony is not valid. They, they were not prepared that somebody on their own could make a witness that they were God, uh, and they were really scundered against him if we can use that word. But this is again where Jesus offends their sensibilities because he says, actually, I'm not alone. I have someone who witnesses to what I'm saying. If you have your Bible open there, look at verses 15 to 18. Let me read those again. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. And when Jesus said that, he was really very clearly saying to a Jewish audience, I am God, part of the Trinity, part of the, the Godhead. In your own law, he said, verse 17, it's written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. He says, I have a witness. And it is my heavenly Father, God Almighty, who sent me and therefore my testimony is valid. Later, Jewish legislation enshrined the principle that no one may be believed when he testifies of himself. And so Jesus is saying, you can take my testimony as true. I am God, and I am the light of the world. And of course, the response in verse 19 is, where is your father? And uh, to our ears, that may sound quite reasonable, but in the context of those days, it would have been regarded as a slur in the character of the individual questioning his legitimacy. And you see, this exchange with the Pharisees comes in the back of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees hate that because they're not prepared to accept that this carpenter's son from Nazareth could possibly be the Messiah, could possibly be God. And when we think of the question of the identity of Jesus, we might ask ourselves the question, why is the question of identity so important? And the answer is very clearly expressed in uh, John 8 and verse 24. Again, let me read that for you. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. And you see, this exchange with the Pharisees is so very, very important because it goes to the heart of who Jesus is. 
And if Jesus is claiming to be God, and if he's claiming to be the light of the world, then, as we said earlier from the paraphrase of C.S. Lewis, either he's mad or bad or God. He can't be anything else. I wouldn't be here if I felt he was mad or bad. And I guess, likewise, you would be here only if you really believe he's God. So Jesus is making this claim very, very uh, fully. And as we explore the I am sayings of Jesus, it's important because we need to understand them as all pointing to the divinity of Jesus. And it's so vital. I want to read this again, and maybe I will have the verse on screen if that's possible. Verse 24, because I think this is one of the crucial verses of Scripture. Uh, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. That is the word of Jesus, who said, I am the light of the world, I am God. And, and so, if I indeed am God, said Jesus, and you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. That's one of the most serious verses in Scripture. Only God can forgive sins. Without believing that Jesus is the Son of God sent into the world to be our Savior, we will die in our sins. And the implication of that is that those who die in their sins are unforgiven and will not receive eternal life and be in the presence of God for eternity. It's the most serious issue in the whole of life. Well, I guess some of you might be saying, Ken's preaching to the converted this morning, what's it got to do with me? Well, let me share some thoughts as to what it's got to do with all of us. Here's the first thing. We are reminded in the I am sayings, and I am the light of the world, that Jesus is God. We dare not seek to share his glory with another. And here's a politically incorrect point this morning, but I believe it's utterly biblical. Our faith is to be the most gloriously politically incorrect thing in the world. Because in upholding the uniqueness of Jesus, it means that we must believe that Islam cannot save people, that Buddhism or Hinduism or any other religion cannot save people. Because you see, the Christian faith, as Jesus frames it in the words that he has used, is actually quite excluding and exclusivist. Because he makes it clear, if you do not believe in me and that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. And another one of the I am sayings of Jesus we'll probably look at later, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is so exclusive. He said, nobody comes to the Father through, except through me. There's no other way except through me. I am God. I am the way and the truth and life. I am the light of the world. And, and it's so exclusive that it is politically incorrect. But the, see, here's the thing. It may be exclusive in that way, in terms of salvation is only through Jesus. But in terms of who salvation is for, it is wonderfully inclusive. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only unique son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so there's an excluding aspect of Christianity in that Jesus says, I am the light of the world, there is no other light. But it is inclusive in that it says he is open to anybody from any background, any tribe or tongue or nation to come to him as the whosoever believes in him. We are reminded that Jesus is God. And that's an incredible thing in school, in college, in work. If you stand up today for the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the only Savior and Lord, you will find opposition. It's gloriously politically incorrect, but it's biblically true. So if firstly we're reminded that Jesus is God, secondly it should be a spur to evangelism. Now I don't know about you, how would you describe May's Presbyterian Church to an outsider? People use all kinds of terms to describe congregations, evangelical, liberal, charismatic, happy, clappy, reformed, traditional, modern, emerging church, whatever, never mind the plethora of denominational uh, labels. But when we've been captivated by the person of Jesus, 
When we're sure of his identity as the Son of God and the Savior of the world, the light of the world, when we're sure that out of his great love for the world he died to save, that he desires to draw people of every tribe and every nation to himself, when we're convinced that Almighty God has commanded us to go into the whole world and make disciples of the nations, we cannot do anything other than evangelize or be anything other, dare I say, than evangelical in outlook. We are good news people. We are resurrection people. We are the people who have found light in the darkness. We are the people who have had the light chasing the darkness away and bringing in the light and love of Jesus Christ. We are people who make a difference to the world. We have a hope that we have a Savior who is good news for the world that we live in, a Savior who heals, who restores, who transforms lives, We have a hope that survives credit crunches, terrorist attack, war, illness, even death itself. We have a hope that survives Brexit and all that's going on because we have here and now eternal life as a sure possession that cannot be taken from us. We are, in fact, to quote Jesus, the light of the world because he shines through us to the world we inhabit and the darkness is dispelled through us. And then thirdly, following on to that, I think this is a a statement of hope that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Look look with me, if you will, at John chapter 12 and uh, verse 46, uh, because Jesus returns to this uh, theme of light. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. So here is Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, I've come into the world to be at that light so that nobody who believes in me should stay in darkness. Now, what's the darkness that he's speaking of, if not the darkness of sin? The darkness of sin brings hopelessness and fear and insecurity and powerlessness and greed and selfishness and negativity and broken relationships and hurt and racism, discrimination and justice. You get the picture. We live in a world that's full of darkness, and the light of Jesus is to dispel the darkness. You know full well, if you go into a dark room and you put the light switch on, the darkness is banished by the light. Uh, And Jesus says, you and I are to go into the darkness of the world that is plagued by all these things, and we are to be the light of Christ. You are the light of the world, said Jesus. I am the only one who is God, said Jesus, but you are the ones who are shining through me. And it's a statement of hope that whatever happens politically in our nation, Jesus, the light of the world, shines through us and we can make this world a better place. The last implication, I think, is this. We must surrender. I was brought up in a, a community where uh, the, 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 the theme of no surrender was ingrained into attitudes of life, not just in terms of the political sphere, but in terms of our self-autonomy and independence. No surrender. I will not subject my life uh, to another. But if you want to be a Christian, you must surrender to Jesus if he is truly the light of the world, if he is truly God, and if only Jesus, the light of the world, can dispel the darkness in my life and yours and in the life of the community and the world around us, we must surrender everything to him. Nothing is so important or so valuable than a life given over to the service of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. We're talking total commitment here. We're talking not about a half-hearted, wishy-washy, fair-weathered, lukewarm faith, but out and out to paraphrase Boris Johnson, if I may dare so, do or die Christianity. It is total commitment that Jesus is looking for. Why? Well, partly because he died for us. If he gave up his life on the cross... He doesn't want us to come and say, Lord, I will be a follower of you, but do you know, I'd like to make my first million first. Uh, I'll be a follower of you, but I'd like to really get that Ferrari I'm really hoping to get. Uh, You know, I'll I'll be a follower of Jesus, but I'd like to get that 
big house with a swimming pool. Do you know I was devastated? A friend of mine bought a house with a swimming pool. Do you know what he did? He filled it in. He said he couldn't afford to run it. I was thinking pool parties and all sorts of things. But we have all these things in our lives that we say, we want to do this, we want to do that. When we come to Jesus, it's like Paul saying, I've been crucified with Christ. And therefore, the life that I live is no longer my own life, but it is given over to Jesus. All my hopes, all my ambitions, everything I surrender to Jesus. So it's not just a matter of evangelism, but using our resources of time and spiritual gifts and money uh, for the kingdom of Jesus, surrendering everything to Him. It's a matter of saying, Lord, I'm not going to hold back any area of my life. Uh, it can be, you know, I, I'll surrender to Jesus, but, you know, I have this particular thing in my life that I really value. Uh, and he can, everything, he can have everything except that. Do or die, Christianity, please. Let's surrender all to Jesus. For he surrendered everything for us that we might live. And he said, I am the light of the world, and your light will be dimmed increasingly by the lack of surrender to Jesus. And the more you do surrender to Jesus, and the more you bring every area of your life and living under the Lordship of Christ, so it is Lord of your finances, Lord of your home, Lord of your job, Lord of your family, Lord of your habits, Lord of your thinking. The more you submit and surrender all of that to Jesus, the more the light of Christ will shine through you. And our world needs good news people. A world of hopelessness and darkness needs people of hope. Uh, a world of death and destruction and disaster needs people of resurrection, faith, and hope. Surrender all to Jesus. Let's pray for a moment just as we conclude. Let's pray. Father, it may be that there are some of us in church this morning who are not yet convinced that Jesus is the light of the world, is God. And I pray that you'd help such people in their search to discover the truth. And here we have Jesus who said that he was God so clearly, so clearly I am the light of the world. Help us to see him this morning as exactly that. And it may be that for some of us, we need to surrender to Jesus for that first time, to say, Lord, come into my life as the light of the world so that I might be one through whom you shine, that your light may shine to the world around us. So, Lord, if there's any who need to make that commitment, that surrender to you, may they do so this morning. But for every single one of us, Lord, May we ask the question, are you truly Lord of everything in my life? And what is it that I need to surrender to you this morning? Whatever you need to surrender to God, will you do so? So that when we tell others that Jesus is the light of the world, his light might be shining through us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.